So please. Shalene Gums, I'm hosting the Crisis Council at the Women's Coalition. How you doing, Shalene? I am great. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And who is this person you have next to you? Dr. Sophia Parija, and she will be our guest on Let's Talk, the after show, after we listen to our episode. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so we're going to go and play that right now. All right. Let's go. Women's Coalition of St. Croix presents Silence Speaks Secrets. A radio drama about child sexual abuse. It contains subject matter that may be triggering for survivors. Discretion is advised. Today we meet Caridad Hagen. She's 16 and a pageant queen. Even when we plan activities for our children, sometimes these are the places that attract perpetrators. Hey, it's me. How are you holding up? You still got lots to do to get ready for Miss Carnival Sensation? I was just about to call you, but my mom just texted. She coming over to pick me up from fitted with creepy Miss Copen. Then we go for a photo shoot. I am sick of this man. I just want to stop. <laughs> you stop running for beauty queen? You can get out of it even if you wanted to. Wait, but how you mean Miss Copen creepy? Girl, you don't know the half of it. Talk to you later. My mother just pulled up and she made me like she crazy. What did you say? My God! Why are you wearing that big t-shirt? You look like a man. Caridad is dressed like that because she doesn't want to be seen. She's dressed like that because her mother is too consumed with only what she sees. Caridad is trying to hide, to avoid, to say, I don't like the situation that's being forced on me. Hurry up, young lady. I've been waiting for over 15 minutes. You think you're a diva now? Making people wait on you? Afternoon, Miss Copen. Sorry I'm late. Go on in before me. Well, it looks like I will have to take out that gown. Your butt is filling out well, round and nice. You have a little boyfriend or two? No, Mrs. Copen. Mrs. Copen? I can tell you are tearing down the boundaries. I can tell you don't care about this girl. You have done this before and you think, well, here's another one. Thank you for listening to Silence Speaks, Secrets Revealed. If you or someone you know has been sexually abused, please dial 911 at 340-773-9272. All right, well, welcome to the after show. Let's talk about it. A live call-in talk show that continues to discuss the weekly episodes of Silence Speak, Secrets Revealed, a radio drama about child sexual abuse presented by the Women's Coalition of St. Croix. The stories are fiction based on fact. I'm your host again, Shaleen Gums, and today we have with us Dr. Sophia Parija. Thank you for coming, Sophia. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us Good a little afternoon, everyone. Tell us a little Good bit afternoon. about yourself there. Okay, so I am Dr. Sophia Joseph Parija, and I have been working with children and their families for over 26 years now. Um, I'm currently at Island Therapy Solutions, and my PhD is in clinical psychology. All right, thank you very much. And she's from here. So we, you, you can aspire to be just like Dr. Parija. <laughs> you know, come up, come up, come up. And remember, it is a call-in show, so the number is 773-FM-FM-773-3636. <laughs> I just wrote it down, too. Um, yes, yeah, so um, Dr. Parija, some of the questions that you know we want to talk to you about is what are some of the ways that children try to non-verbally communicate that they don't feel safe? Okay. So first of all, I want to preface this by saying that first get to know your child because mm -hmm. that helps us to know what's different with our children. So that's the first step. And then we're looking for different changes. And it's not any one particular change that makes a difference, but a whole combination of them. So we're looking for things like the um, vignette that we use, the role play that you used earlier, where there's change in dressing. Um, where children are kind of covering up themselves more mm -hmm. or less. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking for things like the way in which they may 
express certain things. Um, they may whine a little more, they may cry more, they become more emotional, they're more frustrated, they're more agitated. Um, we're also looking for things where um, their physical um, responses in terms of individuals complain of stomach aches or headaches mm. and things like that. So mm. we're looking at the entire individual, but there are so many symptoms that they may display. And so that's why it's, it's important whenever I meet with any child, um, whether it's a younger child or an adolescent or even an adult, I'm always getting to know that person because it's important we figure out, okay, who is this person and what's going on with them and what has changed with them over time. Right. And, so, and that, so that's very, very important to just, so we have to know them first to recognize the changes too. Right. And so it's the paying attention. Yes. Because sometimes the telltale signs, and which is the reason why I had asked the question about the nonverbal, because a lot of times they don't quite know how to say it, but you can notice from different things that something's going on. They don't feel okay, especially around certain people and stuff like that, right? Right, right. And I think a lot of times our children are telling us in their own special way, mm. but they're having a hard time actually finding the words to be able to say, okay, something's wrong, I'm not sure what it is, but I'm trying to tell you, here's why I'm doing more hidden, here's why I'm being more aggressive, here's why you know I'm kind of withdrawn more, I no longer want to eat, I no longer feel like being with others. You know, it's their own way of saying something's wrong, help me. Right, okay. And so, what are some of the types of changes do they make verbally? Because um, I've known and um, I've seen, read studies about it as well, that their language starts to change or they start to use different words or they start to, you know, make certain comments about certain things. And what kind of changes do we see, um, especially when it comes to, especially the younger ones, in terms of their language? and some of the languages indicating that something's going on. Right. So a lot of times our children may use um, language to discuss their body parts. Mm. And so we look at that because we're trying to figure out, okay, all of a sudden they're starting to use this term to discuss, mm. you know, whatever particular body part that they're um, referring to. Um, sometimes they may say, I don't want to go to with this person anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't like the game that this person and I play anymore. Mm -hmm. um, when this person touches me, it hurts. And mm. they may not necessarily say where, where? it hurts. Right. Um, so we're looking for ways they may say it using their verbal language, but they may not necessarily say exactly because they may not have the words to say, I'm being sexually abused, or they may not even know I'm being sexually abused. And here's the other thing that we got to keep in mind with sexual abuse is a lot of times our sexual perpetrators don't necessarily view it as sexually sexual abuse mm -hmm. because in their mind they're not hurting the child they're, or they're not hurting the person. In their mind, I'm making this person feel good. And so because of that, they don't view it as sexual abuse. So that's really important to recognize because a lot of times when we talk with a child, the child may not necessarily say, well, this hurt or this didn't feel you know, in this way, but some terms they may use is, this person gave me candy for this, or this person bought me McDonald's for that, and so on and so forth. So it's more we're looking at things like equality, mm -hmm. coercion, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, you know, is this a situation of abuse? Because many times the symptoms that we expect that they should display are not necessarily there. And many times that's why it goes unreported. Uh -huh because of the, the, the way it's presented. And, um, and, and I think in the last episode that we had, we were talking about Beto and the way that the, the buy-in comes in and how it, they, they make it seem like it's a fun thing and that everybody's involved, so nothing is wrong. Um, and in, in looking at that, and especially in you talking about just now the way that perpetrators, in their mind, kind of create their own imagination of the fact that this child is not hurt or because but it's not really about the child at that point is it it's really about what the perpetrator wants to get from the child and so they have to make it seem like it's something that the child would like kind of so they can buy into their own nonsense I guess because um, that just makes you want to hit the person more you know what I mean it's like you're intentionally creating your own reality so that you can hurt somebody else just for your own pleasure that's really you know that's not cool I remember it's a call-in show. Actually, we had somebody who had called during the week and said that they wrote a poem just for this. If you're listening, please call in because we really would like to oh, hear nice. it. 
Um, so what type of um, behaviors do children or child uh, victims of sexual assault display to make abuse easier, even as they get older? Because I know that they start to develop different types of behaviors because it makes it easier for them to deal with the fact that they feel like they can't do anything about it, right. especially if they've told somebody nobody believes them. Right, exactly. And you know, I want to start it off by saying that a lot of times when we look for individuals who have been um, victimized, we tend to look for those who are more withdrawn, who tend to cover their bodies more. We're looking for a lot of those, what I call stereotypical type symptoms mm -hmm. or behaviors. Mm -hmm. What we tend to have a harder time with are those who tend to display things like what we call sexual acting out behaviors, mm -hmm. where that person is going from one relationship to another, or not even a relationship necessarily, but they're going into things like prostitution. They're going into things where there are even more abuse in the relationship, like physical abuse, emotional abuse, and so forth. They're tr they tend to be um, attracted to a certain type of individual. Um, and so when we look at that, we can see that, okay, this person's having a tough time, but their way of working through it, what a lot of them say, share with me is, this is why I did it, because I chose it. Because I had a sense of control in it. Right. And that's why I went that route. So that's really what they're searching okay. for. They're searching for that sense of control. Right. And that's and that's when they're when they're older. When they, once they get uh, older, but sec, uh, act, okay. So you, well, I'm saying you're saying sexual acting, like acting out sexually. What right. about uh, if they're if they're much younger? Right. Uh, yes. uh, what would Same thing. So, yes. so even I mean you know a five year can't. Right. Can't, We'll see, enter it through, yeah, yeah. Okay. we'll see it through play a lot uh -huh. of times, you know, Give me an example. in terms of how they may play with their dolls, they mm -hmm. may okay. choose to undress and have them actually engage in certain acts. Okay. And, you know, so that's a really good way of um, encouraging discussions. And whenever parents bring that to my attention, I always share with them, have a talk with that child and kind of figure out from them without putting certain demands in place, what's going on there? What happened between this doll and that doll? And kind of figure out what they're saying to you. The biggest part of um, working with our children is having adults who are open and willing to listen to them. Mm -hmm. Because those adults can actually be able to get them the help that they need, you know? And a lot of times it always starts with those open discussions at home, you know? Where a child is saying something and we're listening like, okay, what's going on here? What's going on here with my baby? What's going on here with my child? Yep. I need to figure this out. Um, what makes it especially harder is when our children are saying things about someone we know and hold dear to us. Like a relative, like a close family friend, like a next door neighbor. That makes it really hard because, you know, we're kind of like, no, this couldn't be happening. And for some of us, sometimes we know that that person may be capable sometimes because we may have had an experience with that person. But a lot of times we choose to, okay, this they did it to me, but they couldn't have done it to my child. I thought they had already outgrown it or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So those are, you know, always the harder parts to work through. Yeah, and to, to the question that you were asking, you know, um, we've had a discussion before while we've been in here, Slick, about the fact that you have teenagers that they say are just loose and they're hot and all the mm -hmm. rest of it. But, you know, babies don't grow up learning how to have sex. If you're 10, 13, 12, uh, you know, and you're having sex and everybody thinks, oh, she just hot, figure out why. You know what I mean? That's not a behavior that you're, lear you, you're, you're not born having those types of behaviors, something had to have happened. And so that's like Dr. Parija was saying, that's some of the acting out. Um, I'm going to get, I can't change it, I can't stop the pain, but I'm benefiting from it. And sometimes, like she said, it, it becomes a reason for them to have control of the situation. Because then I can pick and choose who hurts me, you know, and how much hurt I get when, when this is happening. So remember to call in. It's 773-FM-FM. You sound like a professional every time you I'm do it. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to get this right. You know, um, so um, in, even in talking about that, um, when we start seeing children acting out and they're giving us these nonverbal cues, right, what are some of the things uh, that we can we can pick up on and you talked about having an open discussion but that's a taboo subject I mean, like we really don't like to talk about it which is why we're talking about it now because we haven't been talking about it for so long that it's become an epidemic 
You know, because they take that moving from relationship to relationship. As adults, when the problem started at 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, and these are adults with children that are having the same problems and moving from person to person. And then it gets into the quote-unquote voluntary prostitution, where I sleep with you for money because you're going to pay my bills, but it's because I'm accustomed to this happening. This and I know that this, exactly, this exchange is working for me. And so I don't know how else to do it because on top of people violating my body, they tell me I'll never amount to anything. I'm not smart. Um, I'll never be anything. You're going to be barefoot and pregnant. You know, you're going to get AIDS or something to that effect, and then you become afraid to try anything else, right? Um, so how do we start to have the conversation? And what are some of the other cues that they may try because they may not have the words? Mm -hmm. Or the pain is there. Um, I'm trying to get somebody to see because I may not, the people in the family may not know. But mm -hmm. how can I tell somebody else? And how can I do it without using the word, this person touching me, because then I become the bad person. We do a lot of victim blaming. Right. Um, so the first part is I highly recommend talking with someone who's a professional in this. Just because there are layers to it, you know, you're working not through only recognizing something's going on with my child, mm -hmm. which is already a challenge, but you're also working through something may have happened to me and it's kind of bringing out a whole lot of other feelings. Mm -hmm. So I need to find a way that I can work through this and recognize that this, this is gonna impact my family at large. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I need to be able to find a professional to talk with. And you know, we have our agencies, of course, we know we have Women's Coalition, we have the Department of Human Services, you know, there are also the private